If you recall from last lecture, we are working on the area problem. Uh, this was the idea of how can we compute the area of a region with a curved boundary. And let's look at how we attack this problem. So we are interested in finding the area of this region here, this green region. And what we did was we split up the region into a bunch of slices. And then on each slice, we use a rectangle to approximate it. And the thing that we found was that the more slices we used, the better the rectangles approximated the slice that we were interested in. And so the better the sum approximated the actual area. So then if we took the limit as the number of slices goes to infinity, then we get the actual value of the area. Now we had a couple of choices along the way. In coming up with the rectangle to approximate the slice, we need to pick a height for that rectangle. We could use right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints, midpoints, or really any point within the interval, any x value within that subinterval to sample the function at and use that value as the height of the rectangle that we're using to approximate the slice with. So we've got some flexibility here. But this was the process. And it turns out this process of slicing, summing, and then taking the limit as the number of slices goes to infinity is something that we do so frequently in math and science that it's given a general name. And so the value that comes out of this process, the numerical value that comes out of this process, is known as the definite integral. And so that's what we're going to define here. What is the definite integral? So suppose we start with a function f, and maybe I'll show the picture here because this is what we're thinking about. So we've got a continuous function f on an interval from a to b, and we slice the interval a to b up into n subintervals of equal width. So we've got equal width subintervals, so that's what we're going to call the width is delta x, that's b minus a over n, the length of the interval divided by n. And the endpoints of the subintervals we're going to call x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, all the way up to x sub n minus 1, and then x sub n. Now within each of these slices, we want to figure out how to cap the rectangle off for an approximation to the area of the slice. So how do we cap the rectangle off? Well, we just need to pick a sample point within that interval to sample the function at to get that as the height. Typically, we've chosen either the left-hand endpoint or the right-hand endpoint. And in general, though, we could take any sample point. So that's what these xi stars are. We can take any point within the interval, sample the function there, and use that to cap the rectangle up. Now, with all of those ingredients in place, we now define the definite integral. This is the symbol that denotes the definite integral. It's this elongated s from a to b of f, and then this dx hanging on the end. That's one symbol representing the integral. We define that symbol to represent the limit of the Riemann sum. The limit of the Riemann sum. So recall what this expression is here. This f of xi star delta x, that represents the area of the rectangle. Area of the rectangle, which is approximating the area under the curve from xi minus 1 to xi. So this is really, the definite integral is really the sum of all of these approximating rectangle areas and then taking the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. Okay, so that's the definite integral and that's going to be the main focus of most of this course is on this idea of an integral. One thing that's worth pointing out at this time is at no point have we assumed f is a positive function. Our diagram seems to suggest we're thinking of f as being positive, and we're also talking about areas, and areas are positive quantities. But at no point in this description have we assumed f is positive. So we could do the same thing with f being negative as well. So let's look at an example. So here I've got a function f that is positive on some intervals, negative on some intervals. We do the exact same process. Slice up the interval. So here we're going from 2 to 8. Slice it up into, in this case, three pieces. Then use a sample point on each interval. Here I'm using the left-hand endpoint. So for the first interval, sample at the left-hand endpoint, find a rectangle, compute its area. For the next interval, 
when I sample at the left-hand endpoint, my function value is negative. I still take the product of the function value with the base of the rectangle, and what I end up getting is negative the area of this rectangle. And I do the same thing for the third rectangle. I use the left-hand endpoint, I get a negative function value, I multiply that by the base, I get negative the area. So the rectangles sitting below the axes contribute negative their area to the Riemann sum. And you'll notice that the Riemann sum is negative, and that just means that the area of the rectangle sitting below the axes are bigger than the area of the rectangle sitting above the axes. So they contribute negatively to the Riemann sum. If we take more and more rectangles, then what happens here is we're just taking the sum of all the areas of the rectangles above minus the sum of all the rectangles of the area, uh, the area of the rectangles below plus the sum of all the areas of the rectangles above. And there's going to be a lot of canceling out. Uh, all the stuff below the axes, uh, which is negative, will cancel with the stuff above the axes, which is positive. And so the thing here is, is that the Riemann sum, even though we are motivated by this discussion of finding areas, the Riemann sum takes into account things below the axes as negative and things above the axes as positive. So it does cancel out. So in, in, in essence, this Riemann sum is not the area anymore of all these regions. It's the signed area. It's the area of the stuff above minus the area of the stuff below. So a little bit of terminology associated with the notation. This elongated S is known as the integral sign. Why is it an elongated S? Well, you, if you think about it, the integral is really coming about as this Riemann sum, this limiting process of a Riemann sum. S is the first letter of the word sum. The symbol is an elongated S, just again to um, reinforce the idea that there is a sum lurking in the, in the background here. Uh, f of s, x, or the function, is known as the integrand. a and b are known as the limits of integration. a is the lower limit, b is the upper limit. The procedure of calculating an integral is known as integration. And the sum here, which we've seen before, is known as the Riemann sum. This is known as the Riemann sum, so integration can be thought of as the process of taking the limit of a Riemann sum. Now I've put the definition again up top because we're going to look at a few properties of the definition of the definite integral. First of all, if the function is always positive, then if we're looking at the definite integral, definite integral over the interval a to b, then b is bigger than a. So this delta x, which is b minus a over n, that's also positive. So the function's positive, delta x is positive, product of two positive numbers is positive, the sum of a bunch of positive numbers is positive, taking the limit, still positive. So that tells us that the integral of a function, a positive function, is positive. If the function is negative, then the integral is negative. And that's again because delta x is positive, because b is bigger than a for on the interval a to b. The function is negative, so these numbers, this product is always negative. You're summing up a bunch of negative numbers, you take the limit, still negative. Now, in part b, for a general function f, the integral is, well, it's not always the area. The definite integral came out of our process of studying the area problem, but this is not always going to equal the area. In fact, what it's going to equal is what we call the signed area of the region. And now why is it the case? Well, a very, a, a very quick way to remember why it's not going to be the area is that areas are always positive. Areas of regions are always positive. The area of a region does not depend on where the region is. By contrast, an integral can be negative. As we've seen in part a, if the function is negative, then the integral is negative. So that right there tells you that the integral is not always equal to the area. Areas are always positive, integrals can be negative. So that's the first clue as to why integrals aren't always equal to area. What they are equal to is the signed area. And now what do we mean by that? Well, suppose we have a function that is both positive and negative on an interval from A to B. Then it cuts out a bunch of regions here. Let's say the area of that first region is A1, 
say the area of the second region cut out by that function between the function and the axis is a2 and this third one is a3. Now remember ai is area which is positive. Areas are always positive. Now what's the integral in this case? Well the integral in this case from a to b of f of x dx is equal to, well it's equal to a1. The area down here is a positive area but the function is negative so its integral over just this interval here would be negative. So what we would have is that its integral would actually be negative the value of the area. And then a3 sits above again. So that's positive a3. So you can work out the value of the integral by taking the areas of all the regions sitting above the x-axis and subtracting the areas of the regions below the x-axis. That's what we mean by signed area. It's the area of everything above the x-axis minus the area of everything below the x-axis. These last two properties are more thoroughly covered in a course such as Math 242, Real Analysis. But I just want to briefly mention what they are. So this first one, this part C, says that you can always get a value of n large enough so that the Riemann sum is close, or close as you'd like, to the value of the integral. So if you can't work out the value of the integral exactly and you just want to approximate it, then there is a way to take the number of slices large enough so that when you add up the areas of all those rectangles, you get as close to the actual value of the integral as you would like. Um, and that choice of n is independent on where you're taking your sample points in your integrals. Part D says that, well, there's one little bit of a flexibility we had in the definition that we didn't, didn't exercise. And what was that flexibility? Well, we said we can choose sample points to get the height of the rectangle wherever we would like, in some sense, within reason. But we always took the width to be the same for all those rectangles. Once we sliced up an n slices, we took them all of equal width. Part D says, well, you don't have to do that. You could take each of your slices to have a different width than your other slices. The only condition that you need to have is that as you take the process of the number of slices going to infinity, all your widths better shrink to zero. If you do that, if you're flexible in choosing different width slices all the way along, it doesn't matter your limit is still going to have a value equal to the definite integral, which was obtained by taking equal width slices. So if you don't take equal width slices, it doesn't matter. You'll get the same result. That's what those two things say. So these are uh, more theoretical, and again, they're covered in our course on real analysis in more detail.